Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Um, my name is Leah Hines. I'm the executive director for the Charleston Conference, um, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. We're going to pause for just a few minutes while people are joining, um, getting their audio connected and set up. Um, so we'll wait just a few minutes as people are coming in the room, but I wanted to go ahead and open things up um, to allow people to, to start joining now. We're glad that you're here with us. Um, a few housekeeping, light housekeeping announcements. Um, again, as we're as we're waiting for people to come in, um, the session is being recorded today, and a link will be uh, sent to everyone who's registered. So you'll have a link to the video uh, within um, a day or two after the session ends. Um, we're going to be saving questions for our panelists until the end, and I'll go over uh, how to ask questions in just a moment. Um, and then I would ask that you please complete a short attendee evaluation at the end of the session. We'll have just um, three or four questions, but we really do value your feedback and we use that to shape future webcast sessions. So please take a moment um, and share your feedback with us. Um, and with that, uh, this session is being hosted through Zoom. Um, it feels like the world goes round on Zoom these days. Uh, but just in case, uh, we'll go over just a little bit about how to use um, the platform. When you join, you were asked to connect by um, either computer speakers or through your phone. Uh, you're going to get the best audio connection through your computer. But if you're having difficulties hearing or the audio is spotty, you can also use your telephone connection for that. Um, at the bottom of your screen, there are some icons there. One is to raise and lower your hand. We won't be using that one uh, today, but the one that I want you to pay attention to is right next door to that, the Q&A button. So if you click Q&A, a little pop-up window will come up and you can enter your questions for the presenters right there and click send. Um, and we will keep those questions, like I said, till the end. But that way, um, sometimes the attendee chat gets a little bit crowded um, and questions can get lost in the shuffle, but that way we have content questions saved for the presenters for the end. Um, and with that, I am going to turn things over to our moderator for the day, Adrian Stanley. Um, thank you to our moderator and to our panelists today. Take it away, Adrian. Thank you, Leah, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, Tom, I believe you're going to just share a few uh, slides now uh, that we'll walk through. Um, but uh, just as a sort of a, a, an outline and an interesting story, I'm Adrian Stanley, uh, the current Managing Director of Publishers at Digital Science and the DOAJ Ambassador. Um, I met Tom, uh, the Editor-in-Chief, about two years ago at an, an SSP um, uh, uh, New Directions event, and we had a, a lovely chat. I was, I was I'd just become the past president of SSP uh, and was wondering what, what I'd do next in my volunteer role. And I was so inspired by Tom's words of, of what and how DOHA was, was evolving and uh, developing into. And, and knowing the whole world in many ways is moving more towards uh, open access. So um, if we go to the next slide, Tom, that'd be, be good. Um, so here we have uh, we have four uh, wonderful, amazing speakers uh, lined up. Each one's going to sort of do a little introduction to themselves. But but first off, we have Tom, who's the editor in chief of DOHA. Then hopefully, if we we don't have any uh, connection issues, we have Bushrali, uh, the DOHA India ambassador. Uh, then Yvonne, who's the ambassador for Latin America, followed by Judith, who's the senior managing editor at DOHA. Um, so each of them you're going to hear a different story from, but just to just give some sort of context for, for DOAJ, uh, and Tom will go into this in, in much more detail. Um, this is a screen frog job from Dimensions. Um, there are now over 800,000 articles a year within DOAJ and over 15,000 uh, journals. Now the point to note is all these journals are accredited gold open access journals. Um, and many sources now use DOAJ, uh, I know Unpaywall is one of them, as a sort of trusted source for real gold OA journals that have been accredited uh, and approved. So um, I, I know there's a, a real active program and you'll hear from many of the ambassadors 
how within the, the global kind of ecosystem and infrastructure, more journals are added from, from the global south and areas outside of the west. Um, and, and that's really an important point that I think we're gonna hear more of today. Um, next slide, if, if you don't mind, Tom. Um, there's a lot of, of talk, uh, obviously now, and, and, and action within the scholarly publishing community uh, and the research ecosystem to be more uh, inclusive, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, I thought this slide really, to me, encaptures what DOAJ is and, and is continuing to evolve to be. So the first dot, obviously, is, is sort of how exclusion works. Then the next sort of step across, you do get some level of integration, but really we see the full value of a community with, with full inclusive um, connections with, with all the journals around the world, the OA journals. Uh, and and if you, I think if you take one thing away from this webinar today, I hope you'll have a good sense of one, what DOHA is and, and, and two, how inclusive it is. Uh, when you hear the stories of the ambassadors around the globe, um, I hope many of you who, who have library journals or things that haven't submitted to DOAJ will consider submitting them. Um, but on, on that note, uh, I think it's time for you, Tom, to sort of dig into a bit more detail uh, with everything here and, and we'll progress. I'll be moderating the questions and things. So thanks everybody. Can't hear you, Tom. You might be on mute, Tom, sorry. No, the click didn't run through. Okay, so let me start again. The, I will talk about the DOJ ambassador program, local knowledge, and the definition of quality in, in global, global scholarly publishing as part of, uh, of the whole publishing landscape and what's going on in open access and open science. Let me start with this picture. It's a, a picture of a globe and apparently it's very old. It's one of the oldest globe pictures. And you see, if you look very well, that on the right side, you see Land of the Dragons, which by the authors of the article in um, the Impact of Social Sciences, the LSE Impact Block, was referred to as perhaps the predatory journals that are outside Europe and the US, of course, in their view. So there is a very skewed view that we have of the publishing and of knowledge in general. The, uh, the English language is one of the factors in this. There is an ignorance of what's going on outside of the English language parts of the world. And our views are also skewed by the fact that we rely on indexing databases that are very much looking at Western journals, Northern journals, whatever you want to call it. And so let's go a bit more deeper in on the knowledge uh, principle. What is knowledge? Well, knowledge is everything that people know, but the, the Western knowledge is what we see as the known knowns. What uh, has been published outside of the West and the North is what you can call the unknown knowns, because we know there is something else, but we may not read it. And then there is a very big part of unknown unknowns. It's, it's knowledge that is outside of our periphery and out of our uh, horizon, more or less. It's a lot of traditional, indigenous, cultural, non-Western science. And there is an excellent article um, on this. Uh, it's called Open Science Beyond Open Access Forum with Communities. You can see the reference down in the, in the picture. The book is by a, a very famous philosopher from Norway who talks about wild knowledge, knowledge that does something but we don't have the grasp of the knowledge. So what, what does the current publishing landscape look like? Well, the current, I said, is a product of over-reliance on indexing services. We don't know what is not there. 
the average inequality is also based on ranking. It's emphasizing excellence on the basis of how many citations does something have and how, where are you publishing. There is a promotion of power in, this, in the center, Northern Europe and also US and, and Canada. It's mainly fueled by language, English, and cultural dominance that still exists, false supremacy feelings. Those are some key words. And you can refer to this as a sort of neo-colonialism in science. And on top of that, the globalization has really led to more dominance because in globalization, you get one big company to do everything that very many small companies wanted to do. And in this case about scholarly publishing, there are a few big publishing companies who draw the, the whole market and they dominate the market in publishing, but also in quality assessment. This also sadly applies to open access publishing because it's a kind of publishing that is really getting important and all the publishers want to have their share. And scholarly publishing has now become more about business. There is a lot of money going on in there. $15 billion is one of the figures. And it should be really much more about communication between scientists, between scientists and the community helping each other, which it isn't. And I would recommend reading an excellent article. I say excellent on purpose on Excellent R Us, University Research and Ranking by Cameron Nalen and other people. And in a few days ago, I saw an article that they are really trying to abandon the whole ranking of universities based on citation scores and these kind of things. So we really need to change our ideas on what quality is. We think quality is something that is published in a journal in the Web of Science, a journal that is in, in Scopus. Most of the time you hear that over the whole world. And I think we should really promote more local open access journals. And the quality of those journals should be checked in a different way. The way that it may be checked, maybe the directory of open access journals, which is a global open access index, but there may also be another service that we can have for that. What we need to achieve is that we get a recognition of these local journals, of their quality and use by the policymakers, because also the policymakers outside of Europe and US are looking to the, the indexes that are in the north as being the indexes for quality and the journals that they trust. We also we have to make the assessment system different from the one we have now. And there is lots of initiatives there. Look at DORA, San Francisco Declaration on the Research Assessment, where people are seeing what is quality and what can you get in terms of quality if you look at other things like the relevance for a, for a, for a community, the amount of collaboration, also the quality of of the education, for example, or the usage for the education, etc. And I think one of the major things we have to do is to abandon ranking. Now I come to the DOJ Ambassador program. That is a program that we have at the Directive Open Access Journals, where we want to list more journals from outside the center, outside Europe and US, by having people in other parts of the world that can talk to the officials and that can also lead uh, editorial teams in other languages, but mainly to have a step in those countries on what is going on. We want to increase the coverage of our, our journals everywhere. We want to establish contacts with policymakers through the ambassador program and personal contacts. We want to evaluate open access journals in other languages and Judith will talk about criteria for the Directive Open Access Journals. But we use editorial teams who speak their language. We want to have many new journals in that are in a good quality. 
And we want to raise awareness about what questionable publishing is and what it isn't. Here you see a figure of where we have DOJ ambassadors at the moment. So you see we have in North America, in Latin America, we have in the Middle East, in Africa, Russia, Korea, China, uh, Japan, Indonesia. We have quite a few ambassadors. And one striking thing that I want to point out here is that we have a lot of ambassadors for in Africa, but there is almost no journals in index in the DOJ. Mainly because the policymakers view journals that are in scopus as the ones that you should publish in. And many African uh, scientists are still forced to publish in those journals. So their own journals are not important, which is what we have to change. So we also have the voluntary editorial teams, like I said. We have in, uh, about 147 volunteer editorial team uh, editors and associate editors in the DOAJ. And the number of journals that we list is over 15,000 at the moment. If you look at the usage, so how many people are looking at the DOAJ as a source of information, it's fairly global. There is not a spot in the world where people don't look, and but mostly they are looking at the DOJ in the United States, United Kingdom, Indonesia, Canada, Australia, like you see in the table next. So what, what do we do for inclusiveness, for getting more journals in? Well, I said we work with governments. We have a new website in a few weeks time and another application form. And we are planning to have it in, uh, in many languages, as many languages as possible. We have a speedy processing. You don't have to wait for a year or half a year to get uh, your journal handled. We promote the creation and the indexation of local journals by accepting journals in all languages and not even requiring anything in English. Judith will talk more about the criteria. And I will want to emphasize that we have collaborative projects with lots of organizations like Shallow Redelic, Science Afrique, J States, J States in Japan. We are lobbying for policy changes with lots of governments, and we have been successful in South Africa, in Indonesia, in Algeria, and in Latin America. And we want to push more in other parts of the world. And we organize a lot of workshops and conferences, training sessions, etc., for promoting open access, open science uh, in the world. Thank you very much. I hope that for Charlie is there uh, to continue this webinar. Ah, she is. Welcome yeah. for Charlie. Can you hear me? Just let me know. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, the last minute uh, problem with Zoom. So uh, thank you for inviting me for this session. Today, I will share the experience from working with uh, DOJ. Uh, I'm working as a DOJ ambassador for India. Um, so uh, my role, uh, my role is the, I have to evaluate the journal application. Uh, most of the journals application, they are assigned from DOJ to me uh, as editor. And uh, uh, I'm working with the India, Pakistan, Nepal, uh, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka journals applications. And uh, as an ambassador, I also help to the edi editors to improve the quality of the journal applications because most of the times, so many problems with the journals, uh, CC license policies, and other issues. So we sort out this issue with the editors. And um, I also work as to promote open access in region. So I'm taking lots of webinar, workshops, and seminar. And uh, we are working for promoting best publishing practices uh, with the editors and the journal applications. Mm -hmm. So uh, the basic, I'll speak about my uh, achievement. So when I was selected as a DOJ ambassador for India in 2016, so uh, 
it gave me a global level recognition as an ambassador from India. I have also invited for Open Access Asia regional meeting at Bangladesh and Nepal in 2019 and 2018. Uh, then after becoming ambassador, uh, I'm recognized working with the Open Access uh, tier term. So I'm also invited for OpenCon conference 2018. We have also, uh, hosted one conference in Toronto and uh, I have received a various grant to present paper in Open uh, access conference uh, we went to Berlin Germany and I also worked as an advisory committee member for open access week uh, for 2018 and 19. And uh, the basic, uh, the main achievement that we have conducted seminars with uh, Medno publishers. And now all Medno publishing journals are included in DOAJ. And Medical Council of India, that is the MCI, uh, that, is, that is the Medical Journals Association, Medical Council Association. They have also approved the director of journals list in the uh, their indexing system. And now their journals are, uh, people are submitting their articles in DOAJ journals. And they there is a CSR uh, NISCARE platform. So various publications, uh, publishers are invited to index their journals in DOJ. And now most of the journals are already included in uh, NISCARE list and uh, uh, UGC list is there for Indian publications, uh, Indian journals. Uh, now uh, so many UGC journals are also uh, part of DOJ uh, journals. Um, Next slide, oh, sorry. And then um, I have host, hosted various webinar conferences and workshop to promote DOJ and open access. And during COVID-19, we have also conducted different webinars uh, uh, for the uh, DOJ promotion of DOJ. So basic, uh, my uh, major achievement that after working uh, with open access and as a DOJ ambassador, uh, the idea came in my mind, I will work for the open access Asia. So right now I'm doing my PhD research in this open access Asia. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, this project is really globally recognized and uh, so many uh, INAPS and Sparks and some other organizations, they are also helping me for promoting my survey. And uh, because of this Open Access Asia, my research topic, I was able to make connections uh, in different countries from Asia. And at the last slide, I will just give the glimpses of my uh, webinars and uh, whatever uh, work we have done. So these are the some glimpses of uh, some conferences and webinars and seminars training programs we have hosted uh, for Director of Open Access Journals. Thank you. Um, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Well, my name is uh, Yvonne. I am from Mexico and I'm I, the first uh, uh, DOJ ambassador in Latin America. Currently, we have another person from Argentina that is also uh, doing some work for the DOJ in, in South America, especially. So uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, well, in this slide, I would like to present first kind of a, uh, the landscape of Latin American publishing models. Uh, well, first of all, we, we, we should um, say that uh, in Latin America, um, more than 70% or maybe 80% of the uh, science that is produced is funded by governments, by public funds. So that is something that is very important to know because uh, in, in this sense, the DOJ have made some uh, coalitions and alliances with some governments and also with some public institutions that are promoting open access in Latin America. So, uh, and also this public funding uh, model is very closely linked to the idea of science as a common good. So in Latin America, these commercial initiatives and the, the commercial publishers actually uh, don't have like, they are not uh, running journals as in, other, as in, another, in other regions like Europe or the US. Most of the journals in Latin America are run by institutions, mainly public universities and also, and also uh, research centers and also government offices, etc. So, and also when I was uh, listening to, to my colleagues about the uh, promotion of best, best practices, 
uh, in publishing in, in other regions, regions and, and as the one of the major uh, goals of the DOJ, I was thinking that in Latin America, we also promoted these best practices, but actually we were working kind of as uh, allies because uh, actually the promotion of best practices also happened even before the DOAJ uh, ambassadors program. You know, we have a long tradition in open access in Latin America because since the late, late 90s, some initiatives like Latindex and Cielo uh, came out to promote and to support institutions uh, to have their own journals, right? So uh, we in Latin America have being producing producing uh, journals since that time. So, and again, well, the university presses, portal repositories and other initiatives are, are kind of the main, uh, uh, the main actors here in this landscape, right? And also to that extent, uh, governments has created uh, national systems for evaluation of these journals. And I think that is also one of the uh, one of the main points where the DOJ have been playing a very important role because these evaluation systems, uh, of course, assess the journals in terms of their quality and the DOJs ha have become one of the one of the main criteria to be indexed in the DOJ is is one of the uh, points that these systems evaluate to journals because they recognize that the DOJ has already, you know, done evaluation to the to journals. So, uh, for instance, in Cielo, in Cielo Brazil, for instance, it is mandatory to be indexed in the DOJ first uh, before applying to, to be indexed in Cielo. And well, another characteristic of this model in Latin America is the cohesiveness and collective work uh, that we that the editors do. Because uh, again, this is kind of uh, linked to the idea of science as a common good and how you know we create these groups and coalitions to uh, support um, the diffusion or the dissemination of knowledge that is produced in our languages, the main languages in Latin America that you know is Spanish and Portuguese, but also other languages as English in the Caribbean or French too. But this uh, this co cohesiveness it's it's very important and, and I I think that the DOJ have been uh, very successful in terms of you know uh, doing work together with these organizations and well recently we can we can see that also not, nothing not everything is super uh, perfect right uh, so. Uh, for, for the last years, we have been uh, the uh, increase of uh, outsourced services that is, are, you know, um, kind of um, making more difficult the idea of public funded and then uh, non-commercial publishers. But that's another, another topic that today we're not going to address. So next slide, uh, please, Tom. So this is kind of a map of uh, what, what uh, also Bruchali mentioned about the webinars, workshops, and the, all the events that we have attended uh, in Latin America, both in person and online. Uh, we in the DOJ, the, the DOJ ambassadors in Latin America have been invited to many places because again, the DOJ is considered one of the uh, main databases in terms of quality and, and, and open access. Uh, and, and we can really reflect this uh, because 20% of the journals indexed in, in the DOJ is from, come from Latin America and actually Spanish and, and Portuguese are the second and third language, languages uh, uh, in, the, in the DOJ. So you can see how, how strong is the, the presence of Latin America in this database. So um, also, one uh, of the main important things is that we in the DOJs have been uh, been doing partnerships with uh, the main uh, uh, the open access initiatives in Latin America that were the logos that I showed. Uh, they are Latin Index, Cielo and Redolic and now America too. Uh, and because uh, again, these organizations are promoting and, and supporting the editors and the publishers to uh, increase the quality of their publications. And actually DOJ is also uh, making some specific projects with them, especially for instance, in, uh, with Cielo, we are working now in, uh, in some uh, projects to promote the DOJ in some countries that are not being represented in the DOJ. 
Uh, and also some governments, like especially Mexico and Peru, have been inviting, uh, have invited us to collaborate in the design of their open, open science policies. And finally, the next slide, please. Um, I would say that the main challenge now is again the, the research uh, evaluation systems and uh, the good news is that uh, some, uh, some stakeholders that Claxo that is, is the Council of Social Sciences in Latin America are promoting new ways of evaluating research and researchers. So that is one thing that also the DOJ have, have a role because uh, because it, it, the criteria that we use to include journals are, you know, being taken into account with the, when and it is redesign of the evaluation systems. And, you know, also the main challenges that we have ahead is increase the quality of, uh, of journals in certain countries that don't have like a long tradition in research and the coverage, because also uh, we see uh, that Central America and the Caribbean uh, have problems in terms of their education and research system. So uh, we are we're working on projects with, with, it, with that in mind. And uh, also this partnership that I mentioned uh, with uh, Cielo and we are covering uh, Bolivia, Costa Rica and Peru now. And well, again, um, this is kind of one of the, of the main challenges that we have to increase the coverage in Latin America and to show how in Latin America, this long tradition on open access is kind of being reflected in, in quality journals. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, so I'm just gonna finish up um, to, to talk about what, what else DOAJ is doing to improve the global visibility of local journals and those that are not in English. So a little while ago, we um, did some analysis and had a look at uh, the coverage of open access journals um, and how DOAJ compared with the main indexing services, Scopus and Web of Science. As you can see by the chart, um, there's actually a large number of journals that are in DOAJ that are not included in Scopus or Web of Science. Um, and there's some, some good reasons for this, which I'll, I'll go into on the next slide. Um, and in a lot of cases, this is about inclusiveness. There are some uh, conditions for inclusion in Scopus and Web of Science that we um, don't adhere to. Um, <clears throat> so we currently got journals in DOAJ from more than 120 countries. Um, and that selection process that we use, um, it's the same for all journals, um, but we have, as Tom says, we have volunteers um, all over the world. Um, and between the editorial team and the volunteers we have, we're speaking about, well, at least 40 languages between us. So we can cover um, a vast array of the publications out there. Um, to be included in Scopus or in uh, Web of Science, your journal needs to have an international focus. Um, and we do not have that um, stipulation. We want to include journals that have a regional or a local focus. Um, journals that are of good quality, that's what we want to include. And so we don't put any more um, restrictions on than that. Um, then there is absolutely no need for any information on that journal. Um, all the titles and the abstracts should be provided in English. And, then, and there's no requirement for information to be in Roman script. Um, so that, to sum up, really, local journals are welcome in DOAJ, and we try quite hard um, to, to make that so. So our editorial criteria are designed to be achievable by publishers of any size, from, from large to the single um, scholar-led journal in a university anywhere in the world. Of course, we're only talking about fully open access journals, so no hybrid journals, no subscription journals, no journals that are freely available. Uh, and I'll just come on to that at the end of this slide. So our requirement really is that journals are peer reviewed. 
So we're looking for journals that have some level of quality and that we can find out um, what review process that journal uses. Sorry, that's my phone ringing. Um, <laughs> um, which will go off in a minute, sorry about that. Um, um, a journal must have an ISSN um, that's confirmed. Um, and we ask for information to be available on the journal website, on their policies and their procedures. Um, so that would be the usual information like their aims and scope and their information for authors and their editorial board. But we also ask for information that sometimes isn't generally included, um, like, um, like their peer review policy. We want to know what, what people do to ensure the quality of the, um, the content that they publish. Um, and we require the use of licensing so that the user will know what they can do with the content in that journal. How open is that journal? So we recommend Creative Commons um, licenses because they're, they're well known, but we will accept similar licensing. For instance, in Korea, they have um, uh, a local Korean license, which is very similar to Creative Commons. So we would obviously accept that. And we also try to make sure that there are no technical or financial barriers to inclusion in DOAJ. So there's no need for an expensive or complicated IT system to, to make your journal available. Um, in fact, more than 40% of the journals in DOAJ are on the OJS platform, which is open source. We have journals on, on quite simple systems, including things like WordPress. Um, and there isn't a requirement to comply with international operability, interoperability standards or data standards. Although, obviously, we would recommend that a journal um, uses a permanent identifier and has an archiving service in place so that that journal is preserved, we realise that in, in some parts of the world that journals can't afford DOMs because they're not cheap and that archiving services are sometimes not easy um, to, uh, to sign up to. So although we don't mandate their use, we recommend it. And we're actually involved at the moment in a collaboration um, with clocks and internet archive um, to try and ensure that diamond OA journals, i.e. those that don't charge any fees either to the user or the author, um, that those are preserved um, because those are the ones that are most likely to disappear um, because they can't afford archiving services. And of course, finally, there's no fee for any of the services that DOIJ provides either to publishers, applicants, or to users. And that's the same as it's always been since the start of, of DOAJ. And in fact, that is because we are supported um, by library consortia, universities, um, publishers, and sponsors. And uh, thank you very much. Back to you, Adrian. Yeah, and, and Judith, we actually had one question. I encourage others to add them in the Q&A chat, but one question from, from Robert saying, if you could give further details on the criteria you use to assess the quality of peer reviewing for a particular journal. Um, okay. Um, well, what we, what we ask is that a journal will provide some detail about um, the process that they use. Um, so whether it's a, a single blind or a double bind or an open process, um, to provide that on their website for, for us and also for anybody else. Um, we also will look at um, the speed of the review, the number of reviewers that are used. Um, and generally, I mean, we're not, we're not here to, to make an assessment on the quality of the papers because we're not looking at, you know, 
we're not necessarily subject specialists for some of the journals that we review, but we're there to, to make a, we make a decision based on the information that we've got and the papers that we can see that whether the peer review quality is good enough. Um, and obviously that's one of the things we're really, um, we use quite a lot when we are looking at those journals that we feel may be um, questionable or predatory, because that is normally one of the areas where you can, you can tell that a journal um, doesn't meet the criteria that we would expect of a, of a quality journal. Yeah, uh, and I, I think it's also fair to say, Judith, that if, if a journal is, is rejected for any reason, you give feedback, it's sort of an educational process, um, you know, to then improve and, and, and further work. So. Yes. Um, what we would normally do um, is uh, to try and give some reason um, as to why the journal was rejected. And in some cases, you know, there might be quite a lot of reasons, um, but in some cases it's, there's only, you know, one reason or a couple of reasons. Um, and, and sometimes it's simply just because we want um, a certain level of information to be provided on the journal website um, and that information isn't there. Um, and we give the, the publisher a certain length of time that, um, that um, to, put, to make that information available and sometimes they're just not able to. Um, so in some cases, it's not that the journal wouldn't meet the standards. It's just simply that they haven't been able to, to provide the information that, that we need um, yeah, yeah. in order to include them. Good. I have another question that came in from, from Katina, uh, perhaps for you, Tom, to start with, but what's the role uh, of transition, uh, sorry, what's the role of translations in any if any in DOHA, is there any role? Is, is that really down to the journals themselves? Or maybe it's Judith too. No, it's, yeah. I think the role of translations is very high, very big. And we ask our volunteers if they can, and also our ambassadors, if they can translate parts of the information that we have, and especially the information for publishers, which is an essential part of our website. But what we want to have is a translation of the complete website and all the information in it, in all the languages that we can manage. And starting, I, we have English, so we have opted to start with French, which of course is also a colonial language, you could say. But we, if there is anyone who has the time to, uh, to translate, in another language that is not English, Spanish, Portuguese or whatever. And then we will have the website in that language because we really want to provide as much as possible. And we use volunteers and our volunteers for that. I think Yvonne wants to say something, no? Well, yeah, well, uh, regarding the translations, yeah, we have, uh, had the collaboration of people, you know, from the local places, for instance, in, in Brazil, here in Latin America, some materials ha have been translated by Cielo Brazil, because actually Portuguese from Brazil and from Portugal are quite different in some parts. So uh, in order to reach the people and to help, for instance, editors, uh, we translate my materials uh, with the help of people in Brazil. Uh, and also, I would like to say something about the question that we have here in the chat about how we support or provide uh, uh, journals to ensure th that they are successful with their applications. Actually, this is one of the main things that we as am ambassadors are doing in, in our regions. We, we are, you know, uh, running uh, workshops, webinars, and we provide materials also in the in the local languages and uh, we help also the editors like in a uh, case by case sometimes right like we also also have these collective efforts when some editors from the same institution or from the same country are together and we kind of run the workshop but also we are constantly in communication uh, through uh, the email 
with people that are having, you know, specific questions. Yeah, and, and to that point, uh, Yvonne and myself have both been talking about that there's some student journals that are looking to improve their quality and uh, be indexed. Uh, and, and I work with one up in Canada and, and it's a great experience to see them sort of understand some of the, the kind of core things that the DOAJ needs and, and update practices uh, and learn and develop. Um, for Charlie, the, the, have you seen, uh, or can you talk a little about some of the effect you've seen with the journal editors or the readers who use the UAJ? You know, some of your, your, your good story examples um, and, and Sammy Vaughan, like I, I know from some people I talk to, but th there must be some really good. Uh, okay. Yeah. Actually, uh, yeah, actually I have uh, shared in the, my presentation that uh, there is one CSI and NISCA site. So we have a lot of talks with the editors and all of the journals already indexed. And uh, there is uh, some journals from India. Uh, they are uh, run by the students of uh, law, law community and they want to include their journals in our system. And then we have a lot of communications and after uh, healthy discussions and whatever our suggestion they have incorporated. And now that law journals also li uh, listed in our list. So, this was the great experience because we have the one-to-one uh, -one communication with the editors by email. Sometimes if they don't understand, they we also give our numbers. So then they talk with us. And then finally, we are really trying to improve the quality if the journal is really good. And then we accept. Yeah. Okay. Um, we do have a question. This might be more Tom or Judith about how our journals once they're accepted, how are they re-evaluated uh, to ensure the quality remains high enough? What, what's the process there? Yeah, I, I, I was just about to, to answer that question. So, um, and in fact, someone else has, has, has asked a similar question too. Um, we, we have got an ongoing um, process to, to review the journals that have previously been um, accepted. Um, so we will be doing um, a lot more of that, I think, than we have done in the past um, to, to try and review journals on a much more regular basis. Um, I mean, we do sometimes get uh, feedback from people in the community, you know, if they have any concerns about a journal that's been accepted in DOAJ in the past. Um, um, and obviously we can uh, review any journal that's in DOAJ and we can remove that journal if we feel that it no longer meets the criteria for one reason or another. Um, but yeah, I think in the next year we will we will be spending some significant effort on um, reviewing those older records in the system to ensure that they are, well, for two, both up to date um, and also that they still meet all the criteria because I think one of the things um, that you you see now is that we are perhaps being a little bit more strict in some cases on some of the criteria than we were in the past. So um, it's important for us to go back and reevaluate those journals that are already in DOAJ and, and make sure that they still meet the quality standards that we expect. Yeah, and, and I can say firsthand, you have a fairly intensive program to train people who also evaluate the journals and, and work. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's very excellent. Uh, yeah. um, we had a question about uh, are journals allowed to contact the ambassadors uh, and are they allowed to respond to journals? Tom? I think one of the ambassadors can tell. Yeah. <laughs> they should yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, I was just, I was just writing a, a reply to her. Yes, journals are allowed to contact to the editors are allowed to contact to the ambassador. Uh, once uh, journal assigned to them, because once uh, it journals in the system, and then journals are assigned to us, then we have the individual contacts of that particular editor. But before apply, if you want to test the quality of your journal, or if you want to some improvement, we are always open to help you. So we are giving our uh, contacts when we uh, conduct workshops and seminars. Yeah. Yeah. And as I said before, I think one of the our main activities is, you know, to be in contact with editors and to, you know, that we answer their questions in, in, via email, but also, yeah, during the workshops and the 
the, the seminars, we are like constantly in contact because sometimes uh, actually some aspects and someone uh, asked about the preservation uh, initiatives. There are some aspects, especially the technical aspects that some editors are not very familiar with. So, or, or, or maybe the term in, in English is not used in Spanish, for instance, and things like that. So we are constantly, you know, uh, helping people to understand what is the relevance of, for instance, having DOIs or, I don't know, having a preservation um, a protocol or deposit policy, things like that. Also, for instance, I can mention, I can mention the, the licensing policies are one of the, the things that sometimes are difficult to understand in terms of how you know to keep or or, or not the copyrights because for for some countries the legislations are more restrictive than others so things like that so we are uh, yeah in constant communication with them and we are, invite people to to reach out to us yeah. And, and just to add to that, uh, I, I know each ambassador can, can work in certain different ways, but we work with Tom and, and Judith to kind of make a plan for our area. Sometimes there are uh, certain disciplines or topics or, or publishers we might want to reach out to who are currently not in DOAJ, who we know. It sort of depends sometimes where the ambassador's strengths and connections are as to which, which way we go to, but we, we do encourage uh, talking to more of the community and being out there. And it, it's actually wonderful to, to talk across the ambassadors and hear the great work you're, you're all doing. Um, I, can, I can add that, for example, um, in China, there is an association of a lot of journals, open, not open access, but also subscription, but they are interested in knowing more about the UAJ. And their open access journals may want to be listed in DOAJ and others may want to become open access. So it is a huge work, but it is being picked up by our China ambassador and uh, also some of the management team. So this may lead to increase in coverage of journals from China. And I think that the the day-to-day -day help will not so much be provided by the ambassadors those come from the editorial teams in the countries so if there is a journal in iran iraq or wherever then the best strategy would be to contact the people in that country with their questions and then that they will be helped directly by the people speaking their language and also knowing about uh, yeah, how how to resolve the problems Perhaps Judith has something to say there, Phil, or? No, I think you've covered that, Tom. <laughs> no, I mean, I just is the ambassadors and, and they have an overlapping task, but it's also very much the day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, it shouldn't be done by the ambassadors. The ambassadors do a lot of, um, things that are really uh, more top, yeah, not, not top down, but more for more people workshops, things like that, and conferences and trying to convince official people who make policies that you really have some use for the DOAJ and not only them, you also have to tell the journal, journals and the publishers why say what is the use for being in the UAJ? What is the DOAJ? What, what does it help us or them? Yep. There was a question, I think it'd been answered, but about the digital archiving policy for Portico and Clocks. Um, yes, yeah, um, Yvonne and no, I yes. that. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I just I just answered that uh, PKP, the Pro Public Knowledge Project, have an initiative. If the journals uh, are using the OJS, they can have this service from the PKP, right, Judith? Yes, yes. And I think um, the the answer that I I gave to the question was um, was relating to Internet Archive, and that um, relates to the, the the project that we are hoping to do um, with with them and with Clocks and and others um, to try and ensure that those no fee journals um, can be preserved um, in the future because that is 
that is the the worry that when a journal has has no um, they charge no fees they have no income it's actually it's difficult for them to to be able to afford um, a service to for long-term preservation um, and I think it's in all of our interests if we can try and work with other organizations to help those journals who can't afford portico and clocks um, and that we can um, we can prevent the loss of those journals if something happens to them in the future um, that we can preserve them um, so there's nothing we haven't got anything in place right now but we will have yep um i see there was an answer about the doaj index open access journals will include full text articles not abstract is that not all ogs versions can get the clocks i think there's more a comment right did anybody yeah i think i think that's true there have been some uh, restrictions on which versions of ojs um uh, would be preserved into the PKP. Um, so that's um, something we can follow up with, um, with OJS. Uh, and, and one sort of point we were talking about earlier, as uh, there's, a, there's a huge growth of, of preprints within the, the scholarly publishing ecosystem. Um, but as of now, because preprints are not usually peer reviewed, they're not in DOAJ, it doesn't sub stop a journal submitting the paper to a preprint as an archive. Um, but just in case anybody was was wondering where DOA fits in the preprint world right now, Tom, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's true. So we we don't index journals that have non-peer reviewed content only, but uh, a preprint um, can be published as a preprint in the journal. It's part of that journal. And of course we, uh, we are not going to say that the journal cannot be listed in the DOAJ because of preprints. Because you can also consider preprints as uh, as a kind of post publication peer reviewing in process, which it often is. And and uh, yeah, and the other the archives and things like that, those are repositories. Yeah. And that is just uh, the thing that the journals that uh, allow for preprints to be done, the preprints that that will be published as an article will be seen in those journals in the DOAJ afterwards. But we are not indexing repositories. And that, that is another organization that does that. Yeah. Yeah. What I would add to that is that we, we can um, index a journal that is an overlay journal on top of a preprint server. Um, so there are some, for instance, journals that are essentially based on archive um, and, and put a peer review process on top of archive. Um, and we can review and accept journals that work in that way. Yeah. Well, I, I think we're up for time. So I, I wanted to thank all of you for, for listening and joining and all the speakers for, for wonderful presentations. Uh, as Leah said, that the recording will be made available. Um, we hope you do find a way to get in touch, uh, either to support or, or find out a bit more about DOAJ. Um, and I think on that note, we'll say thank you and, and goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.